I thought you'd be disappointed if I didn't show you pic my, my favorite picture of our daughters. Oh, it's not up there. Is there a problem? Am I plugged in? Ah. There it is. The one on the left is 50. My wife is getting older, you know. <laughs> the one on the right, um, when, as she grew up, she loved baseball. And she wanted to teach her little boy when he was born how to play baseball. Before he could even walk, she taught him. This is the wind-up, and this is the pitch. All right. How many of you know the name Dr. John McDougall? Would you just hold your hands up for a minute, because I'd like to look around the room. Just about every hand is up. Probably the most respected and earliest speaker on the question of lifestyle that this nation has. And he recently made an amazing, an amazing statement. 100% of type 2 diabetes is preventable. And even more amazing, 100% is reversible. Every single person in this country with type 2 diabetes could be completely well, including what we call peripheral neuropathy. Periphery means out there at the edge. And for most people with diabetes, they feel it first in their feet. Some people, it starts in their hands first, but usually the feet. And uh, a man, a, a pastor, came to our live-in program that we operate up there on our property, not that far from where the Coosers used to, used to live, uh, or Ann, for that matter. Uh, he had blood pressure that was just, you'd, you'd think he would have a stroke. It was over 200. And uh, his blood sugar, his fasting blood sugar was 300. And um, we actually had known him before he became a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, so that was like probably 20 years ago. In any case, he came to our program and the average physician, any, any ordinary physician, would say to a patient with diabetes, your neuropathy will never get better. It will just get worse and worse. And they're correct, given the way Americans live. And in fact, these physicians have no training uh, otherwise. And I sort of don't blame them, because uh, you know that people go to Weimar to learn the things I'm going to be saying this evening. Anybody know what they pay today to go there for two and a half weeks? $6,500. That's a pretty good piece of change. And I was the administrator there the first two years that Neil Dentley was the president. He couldn't be there. He asked me to come and be the administrator for a couple of years till he could close his practice in uh, Oklahoma. And I met with every group, virtually every time a group came, a new group on Sunday, uh, and as the vice president, I would speak to them, and they would talk to, uh, they would tell why they were there, usually, and so forth. And uh, two and a half weeks later, I went to their graduation, and I spoke briefly at the graduation, and I would listen to all of their testimonies. It was astonishing, folks. They were just glowing. They had gotten well from all kinds of problems, and they knew why they'd gotten well, and they understood it and they were going to go home and do it. But it's kind of different from what Americans normally do. And would you like to guess what percentage of people go home and stay, if you will, on the program? Well, you got it right. I heard two people say 10. One out of 10 people only after paying how much money? And getting well? And knowing why they got well? Amazing. Amazing. Well, uh, so this pastor, 
Um, he came to me Tuesday morning. They come to our place on Sunday afternoon. Our first meal of Neva's food is on Sunday night, Sunday evening. He walked into the classroom Tuesday, just about before anybody else came in, and, and said to me with a, a tone of question, I think I can bring the inflection, he said, my neuropathy's getting better? After how many days? Two days. In fact, we virtually always see that. In 48 hours, probably 90% of the people with neuropathy can tell it's already getting better. And what do the physicians tell them? Well, never get better, only get worse. He could feel nothing from his knees on down. Imagine walking around on some numb stubs, as it were. By Friday, uh, by Thursday afternoon, so what's it been? Four and a half, almost five days. His neuropathy was 100% gone. His blood pressure was normal without medication, and so was his blood sugar normal without medication. Mainly by changing what he ate and how it's prepared, that's part of it, and of course, activity. I don't use the E word because it scares people. You know what the E word is? All you have to do is say activity, okay? It's an epidemic in America. Let me say something about dementia at this point, and I'll come to the reason. I have to give you some background before the reason will make sense to you. The number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is diabetes. And in America today, one person out of 12 has diabetes. I have a slide on that. By 20, I think it's by 2050. No, it's very, it's very soon. It's within 15 years or so. I can't remember now what the slide says. It will be one person out of four. This is a raging epidemic in this country. A silent killer. You can have diabetes for 10, 15 years, not know it, and every tissue in your body is slowly being destroyed. Now, the issue with dementia, particularly Alzheimer's disease, is the same thing that causes diabetes causes the dementia. And most people in this country, I spoke last night with a physician friend from Southern California. We were just chatting about some of these things. 70% uh, of the people in this country have the condition that will help them get Alzheimer's disease. That probably includes a few people in this room. Is that correct? And I'll show you what that is, but there, you need some background before I get to that. Uh, here it is, one person in 14. By 2050, I started to say 2050, and I thought to myself, that doesn't sound right. It'll be one person out of four. Many years ago, like let's say 30 years ago, the diagnosis for diabetes was a fasting blood sugar of 140 or more. Everybody, I say everybody, the medical community knew that that was too generous, that people were sick long before their diabetes got that high. So about 25 years ago, they changed it to, uh, it was more than that, I put that number on there myself, uh, 125, a fasting blood sugar of 125 was considered to be, or higher, was considered to be about diabetes. Now, about 20 years ago, we started using a new way to diagnose diabetes, which is now the gold standard. I talked to a uh, physician recently who said, I haven't done a glucose tolerance test for 25 years. Some of you know that word, that, that series of words that, that was kind of, let's do that to make sure that our tests for your blood sugar are, are valid. No more, because we use something now called, uh, oh, by the way, when this, when this figure was changed from 140 to 125, was the first time we introduced something called prediabetes, which you talk to any physician, 
and they will tell you prediabetes is diabetes in terms of the damage that it's doing to your body. So we really shouldn't be telling people what we tell them because they think, well, I'm only pre-diabetic, so maybe I'm okay. The current diagnosis is using something we call hemoglobin A1C. I'd love to tell you if I have it, if I, I don't want to go too long tonight, but if I can squeeze it all in, I'll explain to you exactly what that is. It's quite fascinating, actually. And pre-diabetes, how many of you know, how many of you have ever heard this thing called A1C? But most, well, okay, yeah, good. Good for you. Most of the population is now aware of this. If the A1C is 5.7 to 6.4, we say it's pre-diabetes. And once it gets above, gets to 6.5 and a higher, we say you do have diabetes. I'll bet, <laughs> I shouldn't do this, I'll bet there isn't one or two people in here could, that could define what hemoglobin A1C is. But uh, I think you ought to know, so I'm going to tell you if I, if I can quit talking too much and get to it. Type 1 diabetes is a very small percentage of the diabetes in this country. Type 2 is most of it. Once in a while, a woman will have diabetes while she's pregnant. It's easily treatable with a little bit of dietary change or activity. One study showed that if a woman would do this uh, for 10 minutes, three times a day, her gestational diabetes would go away and she would have normal blood sugars. So a, a fairly reasonable amount of activity will change that. A very rare condition, diabetes insipidus, is almost always the cause. The, the cause is almost always that the pituitary gland at the base of your brain, if you did this and this, it would cross, uh, gets damaged usually by a tumor and can upset because the pituitary gland controls virtually all the hormones in your body. And so it can, and, and insulin is a hormone. And so things can get out of hand because of that. Uh, clear back in 19. 78. We'll look at the date in a minute. I know this man. I, we're not personal friends, but I've listened to him lecture in person uh, several times, and I, you can still listen. He's still living. You can listen to him on YouTube. James Anderson fed people with diabetes a what kind of diet? High carb, and they got well. Doesn't everybody know that carbohydrates are bad? It just makes me want to scream, folks, how uninformed and misinformed the American public is in matters of health. It is astonishing. We get people well by feeding them carbohydrate. Now, it's unrefined carbohydrate, which is a big issue, but it's, it's crazy how I was in the hospital visiting a man the other day morbidly obese in there because of his diabetes. And it happened that the young woman walks in with her slip, what, what, you, you know, what do you want for lunch? Or what, I, can't, I think it was lunch. And he turned to me and he said, what shall I eat? Well, I couldn't in front of that girl, poor girl. Everything was, uh, don't get too much protein. And uh, I mean, I'm sorry, make sure you get enough protein. In fact, folks, protein is bad for diabetes. Pro too much protein is bad for your bones. Too much protein is bad for your kidneys. I mean, the American people are just so out of touch with reality. Uh, it's mind-boggling. But you're, tonight, you're going to get in touch. Are you ready? All right. Uh, so uh, this was reported in 79. This study was done in 78. And he took people who were on insulin and found he could get them off their insulin by feeding them this high carbohydrate diet. Amazing story. And, in, and their serum cholesterol would drop uh, 53 points in 16 days. My wife and I used to conduct stop smoking live-in programs. That's how we got started uh, years ago, uh, probably dear 47, 48 years ago, something like that. We conducted our first live-in. We call them residential programs now. And we used to have 30, 40, 50 smokers. It was rough. Those people, they are so miserable the first 24 hours, they would just as soon hit you as listen to you. I used to do lectures on the first day. We found out very soon that was foolish. They can't remember nothing. Uh, 
If there's any smokers here, there probably isn't. We have a completely different program now. And uh, over time, there were less and less smokers, fewer and fewer, because people were quitting. That was good. And we started including in that live-in program heart disease and diabetes. And after a while, right now, we don't advertise for smoking, but we get about maybe one smoker a year in our live-in or residential programs that we do at our property. But uh, I have them come three days early, and we do a cleanse. I really don't like that term because Americans think that you could do a cleanse for this problem and a cleanse for that problem, and those things are not true. But uh, we do do a claim because you can get all the nicotine out of somebody's body in 24 hours. But you, but you have to have a rather rigorous uh, effort to do that. Okay. So there are a number of lifestyle centers in the U.S. Pritikin, you mostly know that. Most of you would know that name. Look at the price. Uh, about $800 a day. McDougal's is around $500 a day. Weimar, a little over $300 a day. Eden Valley, a little less. Uh, Wildwood, a little more. Uchi Pines, yeah, right in there. And then there's one up uh, where we live called uh, The Ridge, where it's how much a day? $107 a day is our program. That's our property. And underneath the sign, you can see one of the cottages. We have three of those that we built where our guests stay. This is uh, number three. Number two is in the trees there, and number one in our home, which is now the lodge where, where we have the classroom and, the, and the, the cafeteria to feed our people. Anyway, uh, that's our program. So but back to diabetes. This is what causes it, folks, pure and simple. And the rest of the day, <laughs> the, rest, the rest of this hour, whenever I say diabetes, I mean type 2. If I mean something else, uh, I'll say it, but actually that will rarely happen because the big issue is type 2 diabetes. It's pure and simple, many folks, too many calories. And uh, you may be somewhat aware of this. There's only three sources of calories in the food that we eat. It's either protein, carbohydrate, or fat. And fat has more than twice as many calories. It's actually two and a quarter times as many calories per weight as either carbohydrate or protein. And Americans are hooked on fat. We soak things in fat. We fry them in fat. We have mayonnaise that's full of fat. Butter is pure fat. And, and even, even what's, what do they call the, the butter that's supposed to be healthier for you? Uh, I'm sorry? Well, no, there's... I'm, uh, oh, smart. Smart something. Smart balance or smart this. And, and Americans are so uninformed. They don't know that it's still 100% fat. It's smarter because it has a higher portion of uh, unsaturated fat in it. But, this, but uh, now they might puff it up a bit with some water or some air, but when you finally put it on your bread, when you get enough there that you, that you want, it's going to be about the same. So there's a lot to learn. Now, this is a photomicrograph. Uh, magnified about 7 million times of a capillary coming out of the screen and chopped off. Most of you would be familiar with the term. This is a cross-section. Are you all with me on the idea? And uh, you all know this, but let's just quickly review it. Out of your heart comes this great big artery that immediately splits, goes up and down, and, and that artery, the uh, aorta, Branches and branches and branches, and every time it branches, it's a little smaller, and those branches branch. And finally, you get arteries that are so tiny you cannot see them with the naked eye. We actually give them a different name. We say they're an arteriole, doesn't matter, but they're that tiny. And then that tiny, tiny arteriole suddenly bursts forth into 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 little tiny pipes. What are they called? Capillaries, if you oversee, you have to say capillaries. Those things are so tiny that the red blood cell has to fold in half in order to get through them. Every drop of blood that, that gets back to your heart, there's one tiny exception, passes through those capillaries. And... 
uh, the capillary has a wall. It's actually tissue, very, very thin tissue. And then there are cells that line the capillary. And then uh, there's another one. Can you see where those two cells hook together, sort of? And uh, the space for the red blood cells to squeeze through is this kind of light-colored area. Those of you in medicine will know that the L stands for what? Just for fun? Lumen, right? Medical folks? Nobody's nodding. OK. And uh, here's what happens to that basement membrane right here. That's we call it the basement membrane, in this case you couldn't see it on the other side. You all with me? When the average blood sugar is high, and, and so that word average is so critical right here. The blood sugar high for a moment or a minute or even a half an hour is not a big deal. The question is, what is the average blood sugar? And the cool thing about A1C is it measures the average blood sugar for the last month or two. So you get a really good picture uh, of what's going on. When, that, uh, when the average blood sugar is elevated, look what happens to I don't know if I have a picture of it. Yeah, look what happens to the uh, basement membrane. What has happened to it? Look at the black arrow. It, well, you could say inflamed, but what has happened to it physically? It has thickened. What has that done to the passage for the red blood cells? Listen, folks, virtually every problem a diabetic has is because of poor circulation. Dr. Jim McCann, some of you would know that name. Anybody? Five or six hands, a dear friend. We went to graduate school together. We were playing our trumpets together 64 years ago in an evangelistic meeting. I wasn't preaching. I was just a kid, a college kid. Um, and Jim and I have worked uh, around the world and in many, many places across this country. I'll come back to a story about him in a minute. But uh, he and I and, and our wives were in uh, St. Lucia holding a reversing diabetes program at the Catholic Retreat Center. There's a story behind that I would love to tell you, but I won't do that to you tonight. And uh, we got there on Sunday. Actually, we arrived earlier, but now Sunday we're at the retreat center unpacking and putting our things up. And the Catholic ladies had had a, week, a ladies' retreat uh, for the weekend, and they were packing up. And so we'd bump into them and chat. And uh, Jim uh, was bumped into a woman who said, so what are you guys doing? And he said, we're here for a reversing diabetes uh, seminar. And um, she said, well, my, my husband's having his foot amputated in the morning for his diabetes. And Jim said, uh, well, let me ask you some questions. And he did. And he said to her, uh, I believe we can save your husband's foot. Why don't you bring him here tonight for our opening meeting and have him come all week? I think we can save that foot. By the way, we amputate in America 253 legs every day because of diabetes. It's unbelievable. So she brought him. And he stayed there for the week. And Thursday morning, Jim said to me, now, you understand. Jim is watching this guy like a hawk, right? Because you can die from that abscess that's down there in your foot, as most of you know. But uh, by Thursday morning, Jim said to me, the wound is granulating, which is a fancy term to say it's clear that this thing is healing. Now, there's a radio program in St. Lucia. By the way, St. Lucia has the highest incidence of diabetes of any country in the world. So we've been there, I think, about 20 times. Somebody has to go there. You didn't get the joke, OK. Uh, doing reversing diabetes programs. And so uh, there's a radio program on that island. And the name of it is That Makes Me Mad. It's a talk show. And the host is just one terrific guy. And I think it was maybe our first or second, maybe the very first time we were there, maybe the second time, I don't recall now. But uh, he found out we were there, and uh, I went up, and we had an interview for a whole hour. 
And over the years, these many, many times we've been there, whenever he hears that we're on the island, he calls up and he says, come on up, let's do an hour together. And he is so much fun to work with because he's a really first-class host, even though he's an atheist. <laughs> and there are times when we have some interesting discussions. But uh, he heard the story of this fellow who uh, we saved his foot, and he's driving around the island with both of his feet in his taxi for years, like for 10 years. And we didn't know until the last time we were there, which was there only a year ago. We came home as COVID started, uh, it turned out. Um, and uh, I learned, I, we did another program together, but he, he, uh, he told us that that fellow finally fell off the wagon, lost a foot and a leg and his life, having known how to be well. Isn't that astonishing? Um, so we're weak people. We need God's help. And fortunately, he's always there to help us. All right. So the complications, poor circulation, heart disease, uh, stroke, blindness. Number one cause of blindness in adults, diabetes. Amputations. You know how many legs we remove a day now. Every one of those 253 legs could have been saved. Every single one. Isn't that amazing? Kidney failure. Premature death. Peripheral neuropathy. Gastroparesis is neuropathy of the nerves that make the stomach muscles do this and this to mix and, and squeeze your food and so you don't digest or empty your stomach very well. Infections, cataracts, all this is caused by poor circulation, hypertension, larger babies, and the problems that come with larger babies like premature birth and so forth. Amazing, folks. Type 1 diabetes, I'm not going to spend hardly any time on it this evening. It used to be called childhood onset. Uh, adults are now getting type 1 diabetes. It used to be called insulin dependent because oral medication doesn't help it in any way. You have to take insulin when you have type 1 diabetes. It's a tiny percentage. Just take, your, if you give yourself as much insulin as your body would have made, you could live a normal life. It's very difficult to do it perfectly. But uh, in theory, that could be done. The average person with one, type 1 diabetes lives 10 years less than the average American just like him or her. Because it's, it's, you can do a fair job, but it's pretty hard to do it perfectly, like your pancreas does. All right. The culprit for many years we didn't know, people were guessing a viral infection. How many of you are aware of the fact that it's cow's milk that causes type 1 diabetes? One, two, three, four, five, six hands. If I had time, I'd tell you the details, but let me just say this. Some people have a genetic mutation so that the shape of a certain protein in their body is very much like the shape of cow's milk protein. And uh, if you feed a baby uh, that had that genetic problem, uh, there's a very good chance that an autoimmune reaction would cause that child's body, not maybe right away, but over time, to destroy the pancreas. Not the pancreas, pardon me, the cells in the pancreas that make insulin, so-called beta cells. Those beta cells display a protein. Almost every cell in your body displays many proteins. I, 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 uh, I need to just, in a minute, we're going to see a video about this that it would be helpful if you started thinking about this already. A cell is big enough so that you can see it with a microscope. There's about uh, 70 trillion cells in our bodies. 10 to 70 is the estimate. Uh, and that cell wall is actually made up of two layers of fat, interestingly enough. And that, those double layers are pretty tough. You have to bang pretty hard to break it, right? It's amazing how tough that is. And you and I would die in a microsecond second if it wasn't for thousands and thousands of proteins, usually part inside and part outside, that uh, in many different kinds, I'll try to draw something a little different. 
this is how the cells, uh, uh, not entirely, but greatly how they communicate with each other and with their surroundings. And uh, these uh, proteins are made by the cell and stuck where they belong in the cells. Uh, it's, it's, it's an astonishing world, folks, to, to get into understanding these uh, proteins that uh, make things work so well. Um, and I forgot why I got sidetracked on that. Oh, yes. So the beta cells, if this was a beta cell in your pancreas, I said I wasn't going to do this, that makes the insulin, it displays proteins like all other cells. But because of a genetic mutation that some people have, the shape of this particular protein is slightly different than it's supposed to be. And that shape is very, I'll try to pretend like it's the same thing, of protein in uh, cow's milk. About 80, 90 percent of the protein in cow's milk is casein. And if you feed a baby cow's milk in their formula, if the mother can't nurse or chooses not to, um, the baby's gut is permeable. All of you know about something called leaky gut syndrome. What that means is, I'm going to back up just an inch and tell you this magnificent thing, the small intestine 22 feet long, is just a magnificent organ. It is able to pick and choose what it's going to absorb out of the lumen, out of the pipe. You all with me? So it protects you from some things that you shouldn't get absorbed. The problem is, uh, because of poor living, the ability of the small intestine to do that kind of selection decreases and stuff gets into your body that shouldn't have gotten there. You with me? And can cause many kinds of problems which we call leaky gut syndrome. You talk to the world's most educated man on leaky gut or woman, a GI doctor, and they'll say to you, we really don't understand it. We just know something like that's happening. And I keep asking my GI friends, what's the latest thing we know? And we still don't know very much about leaky gut syndrome. In any case, in that ba the baby's gut is designed to be a leaky gut because in the mother's milk, and this is not just humans, every mammal makes immunoglobulins, those are proteins, which will help the child or the offspring uh, be immune or, or, or deal with certain diseases. Immunoglobulins, you all with me? The uh, immunization kind of an idea. And those immunoglobulins are proteins, and all proteins, no exception, get denatured in the stomach. And proteins work because of their shape, and denature means it got unfolded so it can no longer do its job. So mother, mother nature uh, envelops that protein in a layer of fat. This is all microscopic, you all with me? Submicroscopic, actually. And so those immunoglobulins pass through the mother's, the baby's tummy without being disturbed. And then it takes a big hole that's a little bit of a metaphor, in the baby's gut to let these immunoglobulins go from the, the, the lumen, the, the small intestine, into the bloodstream. Got that? Is that amazing or not? You feed that baby cow's milk, and there will be proteins from the cow, immunoglobulins, which are foreign to the baby's body, and the baby's body will develop antibodies to destroy those proteins. Are you all with me on this whole thing? I think most of you understand this, especially in the COVID world. We all know about antibodies, don't we? And uh, those antibodies work. They're, the way they recognize what they're after is by the shape. So if you have let this baby get cow's milk and the, and the cow's milk protein, uh, the baby's body will make antibodies against that. And now those antibodies will recognize a protein just like it that's on the baby's cells. You got that? And so the beta cells, I'm talking about when I said the, ba the baby cells, the beta cells for the baby, and I think you all got it, the beta cells make what? Insulin. We get to name them that. They don't have that name written on them. Scientists have just named those cells beta cells. 
So that's the mechanism that causes diabetes, type 1, in children or adults. Cow's milk isn't even safe for people to drink. Now, it's a fairly small percentage of people that have that genetic mutation so that the protein has a slightly different shape than it normally would have. Did you track with me on all of that? Okay. Unlike theological presentations, and the reason I don't take questions when they're theological presentations is they're just, it's just too much hot button stuff. Are you all with me on that? But I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner. You're welcome to at any time raise your hand and say that wasn't clear or raise a question. I'm extremely comfortable with that, so please don't hesitate. All right. I wasn't going to do that. Why did I do it? I don't know why I did it. Okay, go ahead. Um, it, the, the type 1 diabetes issue is that genetic mutation, and there are obviously going to be strains of people that do not have it more likely than others. So, yeah. I don't know what that number is, but uh, it's, you know, women are working or for whatever reason, they pump and save the milk or something, whatever. Uh, it's a good question. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to it. Um, used to be called adult onset. It's amazing, folks. Neva and I have worked with the natives in this country. We love those people. You, you'd love them, too. Uh, I worked for Nevada, Utah for seven years, and because of that, we were at Monument Valley working with the Navajo people. They're just a great, it, I, I could go on, I won't. But anyway, uh, the people of color the world over, this is African descent, natives of this country, natives of the Americas, even people with slightly yellowish skin have a genetic weakness for diabetes at varying levels. And so the, the uh, Navajo people never got diabetes in the past because they raised all their own food in their gardens. And they actually had a saying that says, if you run every day when you're young, You'll run when you're old. And they did it. They'd get out and run. That was just part of their uh, DNA. And, uh, but 80% of, of uh, Navajo people get diabetes. And it's completely because they have changed to a Western diet. You go to Las Vegas to go for whatever reason, and you're in your motel, and you open the little flyer, and here's an offer to go to Monument Valley for $125 to fly you out there. You get to see the monuments and eat some traditional fry bread of the Navajos. Traditional, nothing. They take white bread and, and soak it in oil and fry it. That is a recipe for death. Um, but they think that's their, uh, what's the word I just used? Their tradition, yeah. It's awful. They're precious people. Fry bread. Did I not name it for you? That's what it's called is fry bread, yeah. Um, also called non-insulin dependent because you can give people oral, medica oral medications that help control it. I should tell you this, in case some of you are people with, have friends or are people with, who are diabetics. The physician tells you, well, we're going to manage your diabetes. Uh, you need to understand, folks, and you need to have people that you help, you need to understand about them. There is no such thing as controlling diabetes with medication, uh, with oral medication. Every tissue in that person's body is slowly being destroyed, everywhere in their body. So, but the good news is you can get well. 95% of the diabetes we've already seen. Yes. I don't know about that, but I'll tell you this. There is no medicine that will fix the problem. You have to change your lifestyle. Every one of my physician friends will tell you they're more crass than I am. They'll tell you what you have to do, and then they'll say, if you cheat on any of this, you will not get well. You've got to do it all. You can't do it part. Do it part will help a little bit, but if you want to be well, you have to do the program. Okay. Um, Two completely different diseases. This is too many calories, 
and the fat is the biggest problem because it has some, it's so much more calorically dense. Does that phrase make sense? Per pound, there's more than twice as many calories as the other two sources. Let me show you how bad this is. Let's take a three ounce serving of bacon. About how many calories? About 500. Whether it's corn or potato chips. I shouldn't do this to you folks. I didn't take any chips today, and you shouldn't either. That's a recipe, folks, for getting sick. Those things are deep fat fried. They're terrible. I shouldn't have done that. I don't know why I'm so mean. Uh, I was diagnosed with cancer 21 years ago and told I had five years to live. We have clear data that if you will live like this, you can make cancer grow slow. I saw my urologist, I had a prostatectomy 21 years ago. I saw my ur a, a urologist just a, week, a couple of weeks ago, and he said, and every one of my physician friends says the same thing to me. You're not going to die of prostate cancer. And the, and the urologist, who is not a Christian, or at least he's not an Adventist, he doesn't know, I don't, he knows about a better living program, though. He said, he said, Jim, people that live like you do, I have never seen them die from prostate cancer in all of my years of practicing. Well, that's pretty good news to me um, and uh, worth thinking about. So there's chips, folks. Potato or corn, same program. Raise your right hand and repeat. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> How about three ounces of potato? This is insanity. People think potatoes are fattening. You could fill your stomach at every meal with nothing but potatoes, and you'd lose weight. Potatoes are pure carbohydrate, almost. Little bit of protein, little bit of fat. Of course, it's what people put in the craft that's the problem. You understand that. It's not the potato. But people think bread is fattening. That is ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. It's what you put on the bread. Oh, it makes me so mad sometimes. I want to scream. Shall I scream? And there's the bread and the broccoli. It's amazing, folks. You feed people plants. That's the story. I could just say that and leave. The way to get well is to eat only plants unrefined. Were those potato chips today, and I'm sorry I'm doing this to you, were those potato chips and those corn chips, were they plant foods? Yes, they were. They were vegan. You can be a junk food vegan. Is that correct? Uh, we don't use the word vegan uh, in a way because it's unspecific. It's unspecific. You can, you can be a vegan and have a terrible diet. Uh, so the, the proper term is whole plant food. Whole means you're eating the whole portion that's edible, the edible portion, and you're not refining it. We use small amounts of refined things for seasoning or something like that, even sweetening. But this is what you're seeing on the screen, folks, is the problem. That's what's making us sick. That's what's causing heart disease. That's what makes cancer grow. That's what causes many cancers. Amazing, folks, what we're doing to ourselves. And, of course, this is what causes dementia as well. Dementia is largely the result of poor circulation. Largely. There's another issue that I'll show you in a few minutes. I'm going to keep talking until everybody's asleep. Right. Go ahead. No. Thank you for the question. Uh, excess protein, I said a few minutes ago, was bad for the bones and bad for the kidneys? Please, that's a good question. Uh, his question was that absorbing protein is causing cancer. He thought that that's what I said. Yeah, uh, I didn't even say absorbing too much protein caused cancer. What I said was that this diet that Americans are on makes cancer grow fast and in some cases causes cancer. There are other causes of cancer, folks, than just 
this terrible diet that Americans are on. You understand that. A lot of other causes. So thank you for making it clear that I didn't make it clear. Are you all clear? This is amazing, folks. It's amazing. And I'm sorry because the people who brought the chips didn't know any better. And I won't be around here anymore to see that you had chips. And if you want to have chips, you can do that. Is that correct? You can do that. Uh, I'd advise you not to. And you say, you're mean. You're taking away what my favorite food is. Listen, it used to be my favorite food, too. What did I do? Well, there's various ways you can describe it. I said to myself, you're going to do what you're supposed to do. And, of course, it's helpful to have God helping you. But an, un an ungodly person could choose to do this. Is that correct? That's right. Some of us have a harder time controlling ourselves than others, but most of us could, could make decisions. This is a drawing representing a cell. And uh, the, the uh, artist has cut the top off the cell. Let me just, if you'll all look over to the same place. Uh, he's cut the corner out of the nucleus. And you can see the DNA, those little strips in there. These little black dots, see them all over the place? See all the little black dots? Those are the factories that make proteins. And I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. This uh, controversy over mRNA, which is what the vaccine is made of, it's an elegant idea. Instead of shooting your body full of proteins that look like bad proteins, so that, that, but, but that aren't bad for you, so that your body will build antibodies to those and then keep you from getting sick. What they've done is they've taken, I'm going to make it simpler, they've taken a piece of DNA. The real story is it's only one side of the ladder, but a little piece of DNA, and you may, you, most of you wouldn't know this. I wish you did because this kind of stuff everybody should know. The purpose of DNA is that a gene, which is a piece of the ladder, uh, codes or has the information for your body to make a protein. I wish you would have got that. It's strange how hard it is, such a simple idea. A piece of the, do you know that the, the, the DNA is a ladder, right? Don't you all know that? Twisted in opposite directions, top and bottom, correct? And a piece of, of the DNA is a gene. And the function of a gene is that it has the information for those black dots to build a certain protein. The way a scientist likes to say that is the gene codes for a certain protein. Got that? Sort of got that. And what they, what, what's, and it's a very clever idea. They actually put in the vaccine the gene or the one side of the gene, technically, which is the RNA. You don't have to have both sides. You just have to have one side. The factory can use one side of that latter piece and it knows how to make the protein. It doesn't have to have both sides. That's what RNA is. And uh, that RNA, uh, in order to get it into the cell, you probably know this, they had to put that RNA into a soap bubble. How many of you knew that? Let me see your hands. Whoa. You all know it now. Our, our, our cells are like a bubble with these two walls. And in order to get that RNA into the cell, they have to put it into a double wall just like that double wall. So there's the RNA in there. Are you all with me on that? And when this thing touches that, it's like two soap bubbles that touch and boop, become one. You all know what I'm talking about, don't you? That's how they get the RNA inside the cell. Once the RNA is inside the cell, these little factories the black dots everywhere. Oh, in fact, you see, that's the name. Don't worry about the name. See, it's pointing to the black dots. Can you see that? Those black dots, there's hundreds of thousands of them in every cell, millions actually. They are protein-making factories. And they see this RNA come floating by, and what do they do? They grab it and make a protein. What is that RNA code for? Anybody know? Come on, you medical people. Tell me what that RNA that they stuck in your arm codes for. It codes for a certain protein. Somebody said it. The spike on the virus. You all know about spike proteins now, don't you? The whole, the whole virus is protein. It's a protein ball, and all viruses are like this. And then they have 
these protrusions sticking out. And uh, in most cases, not always, but those protrusions are all alike. And that's the spike. Those are the spikes that you all, you've all heard about. And so instead of presenting your, to your body the whole virus, which is the way we used to make vaccines, we would actually take the virus itself and make it kind of half dead so it couldn't do it dirty work, and stick viruses in you. We call them attenuated. And your body would make antibodies against that virus and protect you if a real virus ever came along. Are you all with me on that? Why am I doing this? I think it's probably good for you to have some understanding, would you say? And uh, so instead of presenting the whole virus, all you have to do is present one piece of it, and the body will make antibodies and recognize a, 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 an actual COVID virus that came in by looking at that thing. Y'all with me on the idea? And so it's an elegant idea to have your body make the proteins, which it then spits out of the cell and sends all over your body, and then, the, and then your body makes antibodies against those foreign proteins. Got it? I pro this is so political, I probably should go another step. But I'll tell you why I'm not vaccinated. Shh, don't do that. I'm a scientist, folks. We have no idea what the long-term effects of doing this is. That's my problem. I, my hat's off to these scientists who dreamed up this idea. It is an elegant, fantastically amazing idea to let your body make these things that your body will then make antibodies against. The problem is we do not know if there's long-term effects. And whenever you fool around with stuff like this, there almost always is. So forgive me for that. But if you decide not to get vaccinated, then you should have ivermectin around. Either take it prophylactically. You know what that means? You take it so that you won't get sick. Or you have it available so that if you get sick, you take it. And you need to write this name down. We didn't give you cards to write on. You need to listen to Dr. I'll put it on the. You need to listen to Dr. Corey. I mean, uh, Pierre Corey. K-O-R-Y. On December 8, last year, he and four other physicians uh, had a hearing in the U.S. Senate. You can get on YouTube. Today, there's so many videos of him, you'd have to pick the right one. In the early days, there was just one video, and you, you, you would have to listen to all four doctors and some of the questions that were given to them. But if you knew where to go, you could just listen to him. Uh, but all five of these physicians are outstanding in their fields, and they call themselves America's frontline physicians. And there's others who have joined them. But uh, Dr. Pierre Corey is as qualified as anybody in the world. This guy is a pulmonologist, and he is at the top of his game. And this is what he said. Starting today, these are his exact words, there needs to be not another single death from, from uh, COVID-19 of ivermectin, I-V-E-R-M-E-C-T-I-N. This drug has been around for 70 years and got the Nobel Prize for being such a remarkable drug and so utterly safe. There's just virtually no side effects from this drug. And uh, you listen to Corey. You can also listen now to a guy named Paul Cole, no, no, um, Ray, Ray Cole. Ray Cole was testifying at the uh, State House in Idaho mm, a, month and, a month ago. And that uh, has been recorded. You can listen to it on YouTube. And uh, he is a pathologist. And you listen to his credentials, folks. This guy is... You know, he, he, he explains all of his fellowships. And he says, this is my expertise. And he says the same thing. The, and, and here's something else you should know. Fortunately, you live in Arizona. Most of you do. Uh, the problem is that we have low vitamin D levels. Vitamin D as in delta. And if you live north of the northern border of, of Arizona, 
and you're not taking supplements, you are vitamin D deficient. Even if you live in Arizona, you got to get enough sun uh, to make, you, you probably all know that you get vitamin D from the sun. That's not quite correct. The sun makes cholesterol under your skin into vitamin D. It's not Ray. Thank you for that. R-Y-A-N. Um, I was struggling to remember his name. Um, several hands. I'll start with the pastor. It's, it's widely available. Here, here, now listen to this. This is a very interesting and fox guarding the hen house issue. When the FDA has approved a certain medication for a certain disease or condition, it's illegal in this country to make a vaccine for that disease. Shall I say it again? If there's a medication approved for a certain condition, and the, and the doctor can prescribe it easily because he has permission, if you will. It's against the law in America to make a vaccine for that disease. You all with me? So what the government has done, this is awful, frankly. Uh, they will not approve ivermectin for COVID-19 because they have made a vaccine for COVID-19. So you ask your doctor for some ivermectin, and he or she can prescribe it under a condition that they call off-label. In other words, ivermectin cannot be approved for use with COVID-19 because there's a vaccine for it. Y'all tracking with me? Does that sound like the fox is guarding the hen house? It's awful, folks. But, you know, you and I live at the end of time. The end of the world... The, the end of the world is near, folks. Pardon me? Oh, ivermectin has been used for many things, but particularly for parasites in animals or people. They use it in the barnyard, uh, and it just deworms and deparasites animals, but it does that for humans too. Ivermectin, I-V-E-R-M-E-C-T-I-N. Just a sec. Uh, I'll, re I'll remember your hand, and then you'll be number two. Um, I was, and even I were attending a church in Southern California this winter, this last winter. Our daughter lives there. We usually stay there for a few weeks with her. Uh, and we go to a church there in Marietta. Some of you know the name of that town. Uh, and there's 10 physicians in that church. Uh, we, they're all our friends. Two or three of them are really good friends. And while we were there, and this would be January 10, something like that, uh, Gordon Skio stood up before the sermon, and he said, the, the church board and the health ministries committee has asked me to tell you about ivermectin. This is clear back in January. And I know this physician so well. I know all 10 of them. They are all first-class practitioners, and all 10 of those physicians were behind the church knowing about this. Are you all with me? This is not some crazy idea that somebody dreamed up. And uh, that's the first I had ever heard of this medication, I think. Um, so I called my PA, our primary, and I said, uh, can you get me some ivermectin? He says, I can't do it. Well, so I called Gordon up. That's the physician that made the announcement. He said, well, he's not correct. He can prescribe it off-label. So uh, you can get it. It's, it's kind of pricey. In India, it's one penny for a dose. In this country, it's a lot for a dose. I, yeah, I, I, let me interrupt you because you're going to repeat yourself. I agree with you, dear, but it's much bigger than just herbs and stuff. It's the whole program I'm talking about. So be careful. There are people who will go after the herbs and they think that's going to be the answer. No, 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 folks. It's the whole program. And, uh, and the, uh, 
the issue with, with, that I've been describing so far is a big part of it. One of the biggest issues in all of this is, is the fat we're getting, folks. And what's making it worse is when you take fat out of a plant, because most all plants except one or two uh, have mostly unsaturated fat, when you take fat out of that plant, it starts oxidizing. The moment it comes out of the plant at the factory, it starts oxidizing. Those, oxidative fa those oxidized fats are carcinogens. This is crazy what we do, folks. And, and this is so crazy to you, you'll say, you're out to lunch. But in our program, folks, we do, we do not use any plant oils. Zero. For two big reasons. One is the oxidized fat which causes inflammation, even if it doesn't cause cancer. It causes inflammation everywhere. And the other thing is, it's too many calories. Every tablespoon of fat is 100 calories. So I'm sorry to tell you how ridiculous our lifestyle is, but uh, that's what gets people well, friends. It turns out that you need to listen to your own doctor. But if you listen to Corey, uh, Pierre Corey, there's one of those videos where he's discussing the dosing, and he's making it quite clear that large doses uh, for a short period of time are not an issue. And again, I don't think any of you should self-diagnose this or self-treat yourself. Uh, you should have your doctor. Oh, yes. Corey, uh, I'll get your hand in a second. Sweetheart, he's first, and then you're number three. Uh, I should have never started this. We're, we're not only off-label, we're off-topic. <laughs> but um, there is a whole video of Dr. Corey discussing dosing, and he is, he'll tell, you, you listen to him. Or, or, but you should not decide the dose yourself. I'm doing that for Neva and me. But you shouldn't. Uh, anyway, number two over here. Sure. It's standard stuff in the, in, in, on the farm, folks. Standard stuff. I wasn't going to bring that up. He wants to know if he can use the paste himself. I am such a cheapskate that I buy this stuff that's supposed to be used for animals, and I use it for myself. The problem is it is not guaranteed to be as pure as what is designed for people. So I'm taking a little bit of a risk. So don't do what I do. Do as I say. I'm sorry. Yeah, I would, I would discuss the dose with your doctor, but essentially dosing, you, you medical people all know this. It's virtually always based on body weight. Yeah, and let your doctor suggest that too. So uh, I'm, uh, I have access to so many physician friends. A bunch of us went to graduate school together, so it's, it's really fun for me to be able to get information when I need it. Uh, Oh, yes, dear, you were, you were. Oh, what does off-label mean? Good question. It just means that this drug was not approved for that, med for that situation. But a doctor can prescribe it off-label. I just described it. Every, 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 every drug uh, is approved. You, you, a, a physician cannot give you a drug that's not approved. And almost, okay, and almost always it's approved for a certain or several conditions. And if he, if he or she decides that you should have that drug for none of those cases, and this is often a likelihood, uh, he can prescribe it or she can prescribe it. It's called off-label because it's not prescribed for the things that it was, that it was approved for. That's what off-label means. You all clear on the meaning? Okay, I'll illustrate it. Here's a disease. Hold it, dear. 
This is a drug that has been approved for that disease. This drug might work for other things. Here's another disease that this drug was not approved for, <clears throat> but the, doc the doctor can prescribe it for that disease, even though it was only approved for that one. So that's off-label. That, it's a funny term, but that's what it means. Pardon? If he chooses to, and, and normally it's not a risk, uh, that drug, every drug in this big Bible, Bible of side effects for drugs, uh, you can read the side effects. In fact, if you read the side effects for any drug, you'd never take a, take a drug again. Uh, but they're in there, and that physician is, he can either look them up or he's generally familiar. And at this point, I'm going to go back to diabetes. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I'll do it right now. Uh, anything that John McDougall wrote. There's other people, but uh, McDougall's Medicine is one of his books. M-C-D-O-U-G-A-L, just like it's uh, L-E, I think. Yes, John, John McDougall. The question is, thank you, dear, uh, some literature that would help teach all of this. John McDougall and many others, uh, but there's a lot of stuff out there that I would, you know, it's, 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 it's got problems. But uh, the names like McDougall, and I could give you a couple of others, but that's all you need. And anybody McDougall rec re recommends in his book is going to be teaching the same thing. The preferred food for this cell, I think this is going to knock you over. And that food is burned. The little, the little blue things, folks, those are the furnaces. They have a name. I'm not interested in giving you names of things. Those little blue organelles, the artist has cut the top off one and cut the side out of one. There's one. There's another. There's another. Those are the places where the fuel is burned so you have energy. Every muscle you move, every brain wave, it's all requiring energy, right? The cell needs energy, and the preferred fuel for all of your cells, believe it or not, is what? Sugar. Glucose. And the reason is simple. When you burn, when your body burns glucose, uh, I'm just going to put uh, uh, sugar here. When you burn sugar, what comes out is, is water and carbon dioxide, and energy. Perfectly acceptable chemicals. Water, you, you can just, your body keeps it because you need water. And CO2 is carbon dioxide. You just breathe it out. Is that correct? And what else do you get from this process? The energy you need. The reason that sugar is the perfect fuel is there's no smoke from the fire. That's a metaphor. If you, that, that furnace can burn fat and carbohydrate, and those are the only three things that supply energy, correct? You all with me? That furnace can burn any of them. But when you burn fat and, and, and protein, it makes smoke. That's a metaphor. There are side products that your body has to they're, they eliminate. They're, they're impure to a certain degree, and your body has to deal with them. So when you have a high-protein diet or a high-fat diet, besides the problems I've mentioned already, is this, is this issue of the, of the products of combustion. Sugar is the perfect fuel. And carbohydrate is pure sugar. The reason that it's OK to have all the carbohydrates you want is that it comes with vitamins when, you, when you're getting it from plants, right? It comes with vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals. Phytochemicals is a new world. We didn't know about this 20 years ago. There's over 10,000 substances in plants that you need 
that are good for you and they are not found in animal products, put your thumb and your finger together like this. That's how much of these are found in animal products. How much? Zero. So they're called phyto. That's the Greek word for plant. Phytochemicals. And uh, when you eat whole plant food, most of what you get is carbohydrate, which is perfect because of the fuel and all, of, all that goes along with it. Now, having said that, I, I, I'm, I suppose some of you will say you're just wrong. But if you need to make something palatable and add a little bit of refined sugar, it is not an issue because most of your diet is coming from whole plant foods and you've got all the vitamins and minerals and fiber and phytochemicals that you need. And if you needed to have a little sugar to make it palatable, it's all right. Are you all with me on that? All that sugar. Yes, honey, agave nectar, uh, etc. And most of those are very high in, uh, in sugar, but almost all of that sugar that you eat a little bit of to make something palatable gets turned into glucose. Uh, there's two hands, one back here, and then yours is number two. When you do this and measure your blood sugar, what are you measuring? Glucose. You all with me on that? And uh, your body just does this. It burns a little bit of fructose before it's turned into glucose, but essentially the body makes all the sugar into glucose because this, that's the thing that the furnaces are designed to treat the best. There was a hand back here. Uh, um, what? Oh, potatoes. Not true. Not true. Correct. <laughs> you might die on the spot. I said a little bit of sweetener to make it. Listen, should our food taste good or not? Huh? Yeah. And my point is, folks, if you understand the chemistry of nutrition, you would see adding a little sugar it's just a little more glucose than was going to be there to begin with, as long as you're eating a whole plant regimen. You all with me on this? Sugar is not poison. Too much sugar is poison. I'm sorry, there was one more hand before yours, and then we'll come back to you. I hear you. I, I, will, I promise I will not treat it flippantly. <laughs> yeah. That was mainly a metaphor. Yeah, that doesn't mean it's okay to eat a whole bunch of honey. That would not be good for you. Yes, yes, a minor issue. And besides, taking calcium has been shown in the, the Women's Health Initiative study to increase heart disease. Yeah. The idea that you need extra calcium is foolish. Uh, now, there may be a certain condition that the doctor has in, in mind, but listen, you get, you get all the calcium you need and more than you need eating plants. So do not take... Yeah. They gave some of these gals a calcium supplement with vitamin D and they had more heart disease. Pretty serious. Now it was. Did I get everybody else? Okay, go ahead. You've had your share, so this is the last one. <laughs> That's okay, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> oh, okay, I get it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sugar is in every plant. In the sweet plants, there's more of it. Uh, then there's the, uh, the artificial sweeteners uh, that should be used sparingly. 
Everybody knows about Splenda. You probably don't know. We've known this now for at least five years. If you sweeten more than about two cups of beverage, there is a organism that gets involved and it becomes dangerous. So you should use even, even uh, stevia carefully. Uh, stevia is, what, 2,000 times sweeter per gram than sugars are? So it's kind of a neat thing. Yeah, you can use it. There's no reason that we know of that you shouldn't. It is a concentrated food, but it looks pretty safe. But too much of it is turning out to be a problem. Yeah. And as far as uh, other sugars, sugar supplements, you sh I don't think you should use any of them, any of the sweeteners. They all end up having problems. Uh, small amounts, probably not an issue. Over time, here's the problem, folks. We don't know what the long-term effect is. You all with me on that? And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I want to follow the Bible plan. And if modern science, and Ellen White support, supports modern science. You know that, friends. If, if modern science comes along and makes it, it, it becomes quite clear that something is wise or safe, I, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, let's keep going. All right. <clears throat> Not this kind of sugar. I said sugar was the best, right? Not this kind. Or this. Or this. <laughs> Listen carefully. Listen carefully. On, on page 99 of Seven Secrets Cookbook are two or three recipes for ice cream. You could call it healthy ice cream. It's still pretty rich in calories, so we use it somewhat sparingly. But it's perfectly acceptable in terms of the ingredients. It has a little sugar in it to make it palatable. We mainly make it from cashews. And uh, we, we don't have any cookbooks here to sell, but if you don't have seven secrets, you need to get online and buy it. Neva. She didn't like me to talk like this. I wish that you'd put her hands over her ears. Would you do that for a minute? Put her. She is the most, she's the most gracious, humble woman I've ever known. But God has blessed her. She is without a peer, folks, in the amount of experience that she has had in the 50 years we've been doing this. Running two restaurants, thousands and thousands of classes all over the world. God has blessed her. She knows how to make healthy food taste good. And I, I say this very kindly. In our travels, there's always somebody that wants us to try one of their products. Sometimes it's so bad it makes me want to gag. We need to make food tasty, folks. Amen? We need to get the skill. And in Neva's cookbooks, we hear this all the time. One of my former students, when I used to be an academy teacher, said to us, I've tried every recipe in the book. They all work. And the reason that God has blessed Neva with that is because uh, so many years of, of being involved with it, she has learned. And uh, <laughs> I was going to tell you a story about her, but I guess I won't. But anyway, now the banana's OK, isn't it? And maybe you could make some homemade ice cream that would be OK. Could I eat too much homemade ice cream? Sure. And it's cold. And a whole lot of cold has got a problem. Folks, a little bit of cold is not a problem. Are you all with me on this? Uh, God uh, intended for our food to be uh, delightful. Uh, here's the kind of sugar you need. That is mostly carbohydrate, folks. There's a tiny bit of oil in it. You ever heard of corn oil? But it's mostly carbohydrate. A little bit of protein, a little bit of fat, and, of course, vitamins and minerals and stuff. Go ahead, dear. Yeah. Let, let me answer the question. I've been down that road a hundred times, so I can... I, I, I said this earlier. You didn't catch it. We feed people this kind of food, and they get well from their diabetes. The problem that's happening in the medical community is, and I don't blame them for this, Americans do not know how to eat unrefined foods. So there's, this, is, this is perfect food, folks. 
It's perfect food. All the plants are perfect food. Some of the plants, a very small category, are very high in fat, just as high in fat as animal products, and we use those sparingly. Here, here's the story. Uh, there's only four categories of plants that are high in fat. Olives, avocados, nuts, and seeds. We use them sparingly. They're perfect food, but should be used sparingly. But all of the rest of the plants are high in carbs, and they're good for you. The reason that the medical community is against carbs is because Americans eat them refined. Are you all with me on that? That's the problem. Yes, dear. Pardon me? She didn't mention glycemic index, but you can forget glycemic index if you're on a whole plant regimen. It is a non-issue. Glycemic index measures how much of a boost you get for a short time of the sugar on that particular food. And it's not an issue when you're eating whole plant foods. It's just a non-issue. Your doctors just don't know. But if you have diabetes, anybody, you can get well, folks. I guarantee. Did John McDougall say it? If you will eat a whole plant regimen. Now, it's tricky at first because there's a lot of stuff you guys use that you won't be using if you use a whole plant regimen. Including the chips at the potluck. I'm never going to be allowed back in this room. Listen, whoever brought the chips, I, whoever brought the chips, I love you. I'm serious. I love you. I mean that. But we can all improve, can we not? Let me interrupt you. I, I have so much to cover. I, I get the point, but I have to, I, I have to keep going. Uh, the point is the salmon was bad for him. And uh, I don't know what kind of diabetes he had, but 99% of the people that get diabetes is because of overweight, because of too many calories. So we'll go on. So here's the other forms of sugar that you can have. Potatoes. Perfect food. Absolutely perfect food. My wife and I can't go, very, go out to eat very much because there's just no place to go. There's a couple of exceptions. That, that, but, and so we go to a place, and I just get a baked potato. i got to tell you a story. i got to do this. Please give me a chance. Look at the clock. A millionaire came to our live-in program three years ago because of his cancer. And when he found out I was a commercial pilot, he hired me to fly him to Alaska in his airplane. I would rather fly airplanes than eat food. And so do you suppose I said yes? And so when we got there, they went fishing. That's why he flew them up there. And then at the end of their fishing trip, four, three or four days, they wanted to go to have some seafood. Even though this guy came to our program and knew he shouldn't, and by the way, he's still alive today. If you ask him, he'll say, Jim and Eva Brackett saved my life. His cancer has stopped growing, in spite of what he did that day in Alaska. So they go to Homer. Anybody ever been to Homer? It's, it's uh, on the Cook Inlet, the great big bay there. The, uh, 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 what's the city at the top? Uh, Anchorage. I, I could think of the A. I couldn't say the Anchorage. And uh, halfway down, or anyway, there's this little spit, a little island thing. And there must be a hundred Sifu restaurants next door to each other all the way down that three mile long or whatever it is island. So we drive down there, and I'm thinking, Lord, this is going to be tough. Maybe I'll have a head of lettuce or something. Uh, so they all ordered their food. Uh, they wanted halibut. That was the big deal. They wanted some halibut. And the lady turns to me, and I say to her, 
by any chance, do you have some cooked whole grain rice here? She said, well, we have some half, half and half white and whole grain rice. Do you think it was bad for me to eat some white rice? No. I was so pleased that there was some cooked rice and that half of it was whole grain. I said, oh, I'd love that. And then I said, uh, any chance that you'd have a baked potato? Oh, yes. Oh, oh, let me have a baked potato. And, and I said, so you could probably make some salad with just some lettuce and a cut-up tomato. Nothing on it, please. The dressings you folks use in your salads, folks, are not good for you. I'm sorry to tell you. But Neva has several recipes in her book with, that's fine. Anyway, so I'm just as pleased as I can be. And what I do with that potato, I cut it open and I salt it. No gravy, no butter. And it's delicious. And when I eat a layer away, what do I do again? A little more salt. Is this terrible to use salt? No, folks. I, I could use too much, but I'm not using very much to, to flavor that potato. And now everybody's done eating. Uh, I don't want to go there. Because some of you will really not like me. Ellen White teaches that we should not use real spicy foods. Is that correct, friends? Now, the scientific research has been done by a friend of mine at Loma Linda University, and they showed that the hot spices actually cause lesions in the gut. They did this on rats, not people, but nevertheless. So now comes the lady with the ticket. This is a millionaire. Do you know how millionaires became millionaires? They're penny pinchers. And so instead of just paying it and putting it in his pocket, he has to get it out and read it. And he says to his grandson, one of the guys, I, I flew three people up there in this plane, so there were four of us. He says, and his grandson, his grandson had a couple of beers. He said, you cost me 47.50, something close to that. He turns to his physician friend. Uh, yours was uh, 39.50 or whatever. And uh, mine was 38. He said mine was 37 or something. And he turned to me and says, Jim, yours was $4.50. <laughs> That was the perfect squelch, wasn't it? Anyway, I had to tell you that story. I just couldn't resist. Potatoes. If nothing else, and you want to go out to eat with some friends, get a potato. Nothing on it, folks. No basting of oil. And I actually, at home, I always eat the, I eat the peel. I kind of like the peels. But in the, in the restaurant, I don't. I don't know why. But I, yeah, because it's been oiled up, probably. You'll have to ask that when you get to heaven. And I'm not trying to be cute. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jesus tends to meet people where they are. I, I think that probably what's going on here is that he wanted to show them that he was not a spirit. And that's all there was. But... Uh, there's some tough questions that, that I, we, when we get to heaven, we may not even think they're important to ask anymore, but, but they will be answered up there. Okay, let's keep going. Here's another example. Here's another example. All this is fabulous food, folks. Uh, dates and nuts, whatever. Uh, here's an interesting one. I don't like lentils. To me, they taste like sand. I know, dear, I'm just telling a story. <laughs> In case you didn't know, she was telling me those weren't lentils. <laughs> anyway, um, it's okay. There are over 10,000, I think the number is much higher than that, varieties of legumes in the world. If you don't like one of them, it is perfectly all right. Are you all with me? As long as everything else you're eating is whole plant food. Now, Neva serves lentils, and I eat them, uh, especially if she serves avocados. This is good. Avocado mashed up on toast, and she likes a little lemon maybe on it. I use a little salt. And then we put the lentils that I don't like on there, and it's pretty tolerable. <laughs> 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 
Now, this is uh, from Seven Secrets. This is a picture right out of the book. This was taken in our home. Every recipe you see in that book, after we took the picture, we ate it. And uh, even the waffle for the average American is too rich. It's white flour. It's got an egg and oil. Even the pastry folks is out of place. You all with me on this? For years in the restaurant, we made the waffles out of virtually nothing but uh, oatmeal, water, and salt. We made, this is not an exaggeration, hundreds of thousands of waffles. We bought a soft serve machine and put our own mixture in it. And uh, the same mixture that's in the cookbook. And so we served ice cream on waffles. And there's blueberries under that. Could I eat too much of that ice cream? Yes. So I try to make myself be temperate in eating the ice cream. I could too. So here's the plan. Here's the healthy plan. High carb, low fat, low protein. All y'all with me? The idea that people have to be careful to get enough protein is ridiculous. The average American is getting 120 grams a day, which is almost 10 times as much as they have to have. The recommended daily intake right now is based on people's weight, but it's about, it's in the range of 45 to 50 grams a day. You can't, listen carefully, you can't even get the protein intake that low on a vegan diet, on a plant. You can't even get it that low if you get enough calories to, to, you know, to not be losing weight. Well, Simple carbs would normally be a term that people would use for something that's refined. So when we're using whole plant foods, it's a non-issue. We're not refining the carbohydrate, except for a little bit of sweetener. Oh, forget packages. you got to buy whole food. If you learn how to read the ingredients and everything else on that box or that bag, forget it. How much percent you're getting of this, forget all of that. Read the ingredients. And then you know what you're getting. And if it's some refined stuff, you should probably should not do it. Uh, I'm sorry. Is it time for me to go away? Oh, OK. Oh, thank you for that. I apologize. I know better than that. Whose hand was it right here? OK. We didn't even think about bringing a cookbook. Oh, OK. You can get online and buy it. If your church wants to buy a box of them from us, we'll give you a discount. Uh, it used to be you can get them on Amazon for way, way too cheap. But now they're all gone. And so the prices on Amazon are probably higher than that. We, we, would, we would sell them to the church at a 40% discount or something. And you, your church will have to decide what they want to do about that. Uh, I think I can put a picture up there. Short question now. Yes. Not really. Whole plant regimen is a perfect thing for a pregnant woman. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. OK. So uh, unrefined plants, or whole plant, if you will, because it has all of these things. And carbohydrate burns clean and powerful. And uh, let me skip a whole bunch of slides and try to close with the thing about dementia. Uh, I'll show you one interesting clip, which I need to turn the sound off because I'm going to start and stop it, and I don't want you to listen to him. He's a great guy. I know him. But let me turn. I think that will turn the sound off. And. Uh, let me describe for you what you're seeing there. Do you see those two layers of balls, everybody? And they have feet that are kind of touching each other. You all with me? That's the lipid bilayer. Did I tell you this was a lipid bilayer? Those are the balls on both sides, and the feet touch each other. You all with me? So we're looking at the surface, a portion of a cell, right? And we're going to see how the body uh, controls the blood sugar with, with these receptors.
There's a protein thing that we call an insulin receptor, which is painted red here. And there's another protein, which I'll call the lay term. It's a sugar grabber. And it looks like a funnel in this simple diagram. So here's how it works. Let's see. I want to play it. Start it and stop it. So uh, you see where it says cell membrane? You get the idea, this, this double layer, everybody? OK. And the red things are called insulin receptors. It's a protein that is able to grab a hold of an insulin because of its shape. All proteins work because of their shapes, and our bodies make them to do these jobs. The yellow dots under or inside the cell are little fatty particles. A better, a better term is they are actually fatty acids, but for the lay people here, it's like a fatty particle. And uh, what happens is when uh, it's time for sugar to move from the bloodstream into the cell, this is what goes on. A piece of insulin comes floating by, and the insulin receptor grabs it. Are you with me so far? As a result of grabbing it, a chemical signal passes down the receptor into the cell. It's illustrated by a little ball. It's a very simple illustration, but it's actually a chemical signal that is, is trying to send the message to inside the cell to send sugar grabbers. But because of the presence of these fatty acids, it blocks the signal. Most of you in here probably are eating too much fat. And your body cannot control the sugar very well because of these fatty acids that build up inside the cell when you're eating too much fat. You all with me on this? And uh, we can remove those in a day sometimes from people's bodies by putting them on a whole plant regimen, maybe two days. And suddenly, their blood sugars start to drop because this mechanism is no longer interfering. And um, so you get rid of those by putting them on a low fat, if you will, or a plant regimen. And the signal now goes down, and the sugar grabbers are brought to the surface, which are also protein structures, a certain shape. And the sugar pours from the blood inside the cell. What has that done to the amount of sugar that's in the blood? decreased it. Are you all with me? This is the mechanism that the body uses to control the sugar perfectly, but it does not work on the American and even the average Adventist, I shouldn't do this, who's eating chips. OK, the question is, <laughs> what about an air fryer? Just fine. We make chips all the time by baking them. We cut potatoes very thinly. In fact, there's a new gizmo that we now use. It's too much work, really, but it's uh, called Chiptastic. It's a plastic thing that you can, and they even have a little mandolin to make the thin slices. And you fold them and put them in all the way around in there. You put it in the microwave for five minutes, and you have potato chips. And they're just as good. They're just as good, in my opinion. You should, when you cut the potato, it will be moist, correct? You need to salt it on both sides when it's moist so the salt will stick. And it's OK, folks, to use a little salt. It's OK to use enough salt to make something tasty. And they're just as good as the oil-filled ones. But it's a lot of work for a crowd. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Neva said it's OK for one or two persons. For a crowd, it would be a lot of work. Let me, can I keep going or something critical? OK. I want to go now, to the, I want to go now to, the, to the issue on dementia and show you how that, what the issues are there. This diagram illustrates the issue. Let me start the program again. Uh, where did I lay my remote? Oh, on the floor. Um, so I've got a graph here where this is time, and this is the amount of insulin that's in the blood. 
and for the normal person uh, that's on a healthy lifestyle, there's a certain amount of insulin. It goes up and down a little bit after a meal and whatever, but that yellow line is showing you uh, this would be this would be non-insulin. This is more and more insulin, so this is showing you the amount of insulin over time that's in this person's blood. Are you all with me on what I'm trying to describe? Okay, so the person who is on their way to get diabetes, this is what starts to happen. That uh, bluish line represents that in order to, get, to keep your blood sugar normal, the body has to start using more and more insulin. Your blood sugar during this whole period from here to here. This is, you understand, this is time, folks, everybody? You're, so over this whole time, and this is often a 10-year span where this is taking place, the blood sugar is normal, even though the body has to be making quite a bit more insulin than it was before to control it. You all with me on the idea? And uh, finally, the pancreas fatigues or some of the cells start to die, and it cannot keep up with the demand. It's at this point, whoops, wrong button. It's at this point right here where your blood sugar might start would be, would be rising above normal because this demand for insulin is not, the pancreas is not able to meet the demand. It's way above what the pancreas should be asked to do. And so if, if this person went to see their physician along in here somewhere, the physician would find that their blood sugar was abnormal. Can you see that? And uh, the physician will say to that person, you have insulin resistance. And uh, the average American, oh, okay, doc, what do I do? We'll take these pills. Or eventually, uh, the pills just aren't doing it, so we're going to give you some more insulin. Here's the issue, folks. We did not know this until just several years ago. This elevated level of insulin is almost certainly one of the biggest issues in dementia. Because your brain, for all these years, where your blood sugar is still normal, are you all with me, has this elevated level of insulin. Bad for our bodies and especially dangerous. We think, we know that diabetes is the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. You all with me on this? And we're quite certain that the issue is this elevated insulin which all kinds of Americans have going on in their bodies. The only time the physician ever knows that there's a problem is when it's been going on long enough that the, that, the, that the demand is so high that your body can't keep up with it. And then you're diagnosed with diabetes. But in all those years preceding, folks, it's like you're a diabetic in that sense. You all with me on this? So this is a big issue, and the whole issue is those little yellow particles. That's what causes the insulin resistance. Are you all with me on that? Everybody, you got that? How do you get rid of those little yellow particles? By using whole plant foods where you don't have so much fat. Those yellow particles are actually fatty acids, but it's essentially fatty particles. See? It's amazing, folks, what we, how much better we could do. And, and everywhere you turn, this issue I'm describing right now, I'm not talking about the elevated insulin, but just the excess fat, everywhere you turn, it's, it's better for your body in every way you can think of. A what? Blindness. Oh, blindness. Uh, yeah, the number one cause in uh, adults in this country for blindness is diabetes. It's because of circulation. Those little tiny capillaries in the eye, everybody knows about this. You, you have a problem, and the doctor is going to fix it with a laser. All they do is seal off that capillary right there so it can't ooze out any blood anymore. And every time you seal off a capillary there, you're reducing your ability to see a little bit. And finally, blindness is the result. Yeah, thank you for the question. Okay. Wait a minute. Not glucosamine, but the glucose. Okay. Is the lack of glucose a problem for joints? Well... I suppose indirectly you could figure out some way. The point is, if you're eating whole plant foods, you're getting enough glucose because, well, if you're not eating enough, 
Well, if you what? I'm not. I'm not sure. I understand the question. Well, oh, well, the fat. Yeah, the, the the deal with the fatty acids is if there's too many, you can't control your blood sugar. But that that's not because there's a lack of glucose. It's just because you can't get the sugar from the blood into the cells so that it can use it for energy. All right. Yes, dear. Okay, thank you, dear. That's a good point. Most of the back problems in this country are caused by disc problems. Is that correct? The discs are made of, uh, of a tissue that needs very little nutrition. So there's an artery that runs up the back, and out of that artery branches little tiny arteries, one to each disc. Got it? Those little tiny arteries if they're healthy, can provide plenty of nutrition to that disc, this fibrous stuff that, you know, makes up our joints everywhere. But because those arteries are so tiny, improper living makes the nutrition to the discs be diminished. And so we have all these back problems because of poor circulation, because of poor dietary habits. And if you change your lifestyle, those arteries will recover. We're not talking plaque in those arteries. We're just talking inflammation and uh, thereby some swelling and some obstruction. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing story that very few people, I've never, I've only met one physician, I'm sure there's others that know this, but I've only met one physician where we first learned this that really figured out what was going on with these back problems. Degenerative disc disease is the result of poor circulation almost always. Some genetic problems once in a great while, but essentially it's, it's poor circulation. It's amazing, folks. Ellen White says this, perfect circulation is perfect health. Now, that's a little bit of a simplification, but that, that is such a big issue in the way we live. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. What about balancing the foods we eat? It's really hard. It's really hardly an issue. If uh, do you know? There's a story. One of my professors found this is back when I was in graduate school. Found out that there was a that there was a tribe in the mountains of South America that were getting 97% of their calories from sweet, sweet potatoes. And he thought, what an opportunity. I'm going to take my 12 PhD candidates in nutrition down there, and we'll help these people you know, do it better. And they went down there with their tents and their computers and, and, and studied these guys, for these people, for several days who work all day out in the sun hoeing their sweet potatoes. And uh, they couldn't find anything wrong with these people. Although they're sitting in their tents one of those nights and somebody says, hey, look, they're not getting enough water. Uh, let's show them that they should drink more water. And so they uh, got urine samples from the natives who really couldn't figure out what was going on. But OK, here's the samples. And, they, and, the, and the scientists put their little densitometers. You know what a densitometer is? It measures the density of something, of fluid. And their, their urine was about the same as distilled water. In other words, this plant regimen was perfect food, even though they got 97% of their calories from one food. They were in perfect health. Were they getting enough activity? Were they getting enough vitamin D? And uh, it's really not an issue. You could eat almost any plant you want, and that was almost all you ate, and you'd probably be just fine. It's amazing. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about this much of that, this much of that. Just eat plants. You were next, and then you. But I, I was pointing to her, dear. I'm sorry. And then you'll be next. Oh, I'm sorry. Neva has interrupted. It's a good thing she's here, folks. You folks that leave here frustrated. What about their water? All of this carbohydrate they're eating, folks, turns into what? Water. 
I'm not saying you should stop drinking. Don't misunderstand me because you're not getting that much carbohydrate. But that's why. That's why their urine was so pure because they had so much carbohydrate in their diet. And when you burn hard carbohydrate, what do you get? Water, energy. Uh, it's amazing, friends. Now we'll go back here. Oh, 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 thank you. I, di I, I, had to, I didn't hear it. She said, on a plant-based diet, do you need to be uh, B12 supplemented? And the answer is yes and no. The problem is we're too clean. There is B12 in the dirt, folks. It is just ubiquitous in large amounts. If you licked your hand once a day, you'd get enough B12 after working in the garden. We're just too clean. This is why Adam and Eve and everybody else didn't have a problem with B12. We are so clean in this country that you should supplement with B12. It doesn't take much. You all know probably how to do it. But yes, you should supplement unless you lick your hand every day. I think the next person was here. D. Ah, how much vitamin D? Very, very good question. Uh, and, and you should listen to Dr. Ryan Cole. Uh, great presentation. This guy is so on top of his, of his business. And uh, as a scientist, I can tell in three minutes if somebody knows what they're talking about. And this guy is so qualified. And he simply says the problem with COVID is a vitamin D deficiency. Who was it back here that was talking about your immune system, C? And if you live north of the northern border of uh, Arizona, which I think is the 30th parallel or the 30th 35th parallel. Anyway, uh, you can't get vitamin D if your shadow is longer than you are tall from the sun. You don't get it from the sun. The sun makes cholesterol in your body into vitamin D. You all with me on that? Okay. So up where I live, folks, there's Dr. Cole said, if you live above that 35th parallel and you're not supplementing, you are D deficient. And his opinion is, the problem isn't COVID. The problem is a deficient vitamin D level. You all with me on this idea? And if there's anybody that knows what he's talking about, it would be him. He's a pathologist with tremendous qualifications from other training that he's had. And he says, I'm an expert. This is my expertise. And so, OK, thank you, dear. It's a good thing she's here, isn't it? Boy, I'll tell you. Uh, the darker your skin, the more time it takes to get the right amount of vitamin D. When, in all the years we spent working in the islands, the people are there mostly from Africa. And it takes 10 to 50 times as much sun for them to get enough vitamin D as it does for somebody with a light skin. So, uh, so well, the, not milligrams, but how many international units. Let your doctor be your guide, but all of them are going to say about the same thing. You should be taking eight to 10,000 units of vitamin D a day. Yeah. I think it's time to quit. Shall we vote? Oh, eight to 10,000 units a day. Uh, you can, uh, vitamin D can be toxic, but it takes huge amounts of vitamin D, like 50,000 units a day for a long time. So it's not an issue to take that much at all. But that's the, that's the recommendation right now that uh, it's good to get it from the sun. It's probably better to get it from the sun, but there has been research done, folks, on how supplements do in comparison to sunlight, and it looks like it's just fine to be using the supplements. So, you have the last question. Uh oh, she has two. Oh, the cookbook is Seven Secrets Cookbook. You just go ahead. Good question. What about hypoglycemia? Really good question. Because it was a real fad here a few years back. You don't hear it so much anymore. Every physician friend of mine does the same thing. If you're hypoglycemic, you put them on a whole plant regimen. And the body controls the sugar perfectly instead of these big spikes and these big drops. Works perfect. Yeah, it will. It, uh, it always. But folks, you have to do it. You can't do part of it and hope to get much results, right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these marvelous bodies that you have made. 
and uh, every one of us has not done the perfect work with it, and we're all wanting to improve. Lord, bless our efforts to do better. Thank you for your patience. Help us, Lord, to be patient with each other. I pray in Jesus' name. That's an important point, folks. In spite of the fact that I teased you about your chips, don't criticize other people. Be patient with each other. Encourage each other. And sometimes you need to just keep your mouth shut and leave people alone. Are you all with me? Like I should have done this evening. <laughs>